Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode. Uh, be honest, have you or have you not been losing sleep wondering why it is that some things are acids and some things are bases and or not acids or bases at all? Um, you can be honest with me. Uh, a lot of people lose sleep over this kind of thing, but hopefully if all goes according to plan in a few minutes, you'll be getting better sleep because you know why some things are acids and not, and some, why some things are strong acids and some things are weak acids. For example, I have a picture of lactic acid here on uh, the screen. And it says lactic acid, so we know it is an acid, but why? Like, what is it about this structure that makes it an acid? And why is it a weak acid and not a strong acid? These are questions we're gonna be looking at answering uh, during the course of this video. So, sit tight. Um, first, a quick little detour to talk about pKa and pKb. Um, because some of the charts I'm using in this video list acids by their pKa and their pKbs, uh, if they're bases. So, what is pKa? pKa, in the same way as pH is the negative log of the H plus concentration, pKa is the negative log of the Ka value for that acid. And in general, the larger the pKa, the weaker the acid. So, if the weaker acid has a 10 to the minus 10th, the negative log of that is 10, so it's a higher number than say a 10 to the minus four, which the negative log would be four. Um, and pKb in a similar manner is just the negative log of the Kb value for bases. Okay, and again, a larger K, pKb is a weaker base. And just for fun, because I like to have fun with pKa equations, um, we've already been uh, experiencing the fact that Ka times Kb equals Kw. So the Ka for an acid, times Kb for its conjugate equals Kw for water. So that's kind of nice. Well, what if we take the negative log of everything there and we get an equation where the pKa plus the pKb for its conjugate actually equal pKw, which is 14. So that's kind of a lot of fun. So if you know the pKa, you can find its pKb for its conjugate and vice versa. So make a note of that. All right, let's get down into uh, acid structure. So it turns out there are two factors that determine the extent to which something acts as a Bronsted acid. Bronsted acid, we're using that definition as a proton donor. That's what acids do, they donate protons. And some acids are better at donating protons than others. So those would be more of our strong acids than our weak acids. And the extent to which they can be that um, has everything to do with number one, the strength of the bond, meaning the bond to the height of the proton to the rest of the molecule, how strong that bond is, because if it's a strong bond, that proton is not gonna to wanna to pop off very easily. But if it's a weaker bond, then the proton's gonna pop off more easily, you'll have a stronger acid and so on. Also the polarity of the bond, how polar is that bond? And uh, in general, the more polar or lopsided it is, that means you know the proton is positive, the rest of the other atom is more electronegative. And if there's a big difference there, the electrons get transferred more toward the electronegative atom and the hydrogen pops off you. So again, the stronger the acid. Um, so make a note of those two things. We're gonna look at a, some examples here. Now, a lot of molecules have OHs on them. A lot of molecules have hydrogens attached to O's and then some other stuff attached there. One of these, like this one, sulfuric acid, is a strong acid. One of these is a strong base, but they have, both have OHs in them, right? So do you see the similarity? What makes the makes it uh, different. Why is one an acid and one's a base? Well, I want to go on a little detour here. And let's think about that. Let's say we have some atom or molecule structure, we'll call it X, and then there's an O and an H attached to it. So sometimes that hydrogen will pop off as an acid, sometimes it won't. So what happens there? So let's say X happens to be a potassium. So potassium is not very electronegative at all. It's actually a metal, more likely to dump its electrons than anything. And just for fun, let's look at a electronegativities chart, um, similar to something you might have or you can find on the internet. Um, generally things over here, these metals have low electronegativities. They don't want electrons pretty much at all. Um, whereas everything up here, this is one of our periodic trends. These ID guys up here really want electrons. They're very electronegative or electrons are attracted to them. Um, so that's why they have high electronegativities. 
So um, keep these guys in mind over here because they play a huge part in acid strength. But potassium, not very electronegative, ready to dump its electrons. So instead of really sharing electrons or pulling electrons toward it, it basically dumps those off to the oxygen to make a hydroxide ion, which is a negatively charged polyatomic ion. And you're not going to have an acid there. You're actually going to have a strong base. So there you have that. Well, what if we move to the right along the periodic table and we get a carbon? Carbon is kind of in the middle. It's not very electronegative, but it's not not negative either. Um, and carbon forms a pretty strong bond, fairly, and it's a fairly polar bond that the electrons are going toward here, toward the oxygens. Um, but if all these carbons are attached, to, whether a carbon, oxygen, hydrogen will act like an acid, depends on what's attached to the carbon. If the carbon's attached to a bunch of other carbons and hydrogens, nothing there that's very electronegative, this will be an alcohol without a lot of acid base property. But if the carbon, here we're going to turn the corner, has the OH, but also a double bonded oxygen on it, that's another very electronegative atom. And that means the electron density is going to be pulled more toward the left of my drawing here. And because of that, those oxygen pulling electrons toward it, the hydrogen pops off easier and we have a carboxylic acid. So it really depends on what's on the other end from the hydrogen and how electronegative it actually is. Let's do a couple more examples for fun. Let's do a nitrogen attached to the oxygen attached to the hydrogen. Okay. And um, nitrogen is fairly electronegative. And um, also a factor is how many electronegative atoms there actually are. So imagine you have the nitrogen attached to another oxygen. So you have two oxygens and a nitrogen, fairly electronegative. The electrons are going to be pulled this way, but not too strongly. And that hydrogen will pop off, but it'll be a weak acid, HNO2, nitrous acid. On the other hand, if you put a third oxygen on it, like that, then you get a whole bunch of electronegative atoms in there. The electron density gets pulled more. These electrons are pulled more that way. In fact, they actually jump on and make a nitrate ion and the hydrogen pops off as a proton and we have a strong acid, nitric acid. In general, the more oxygens around that other atom there, the more strong the acid is going to be because oxygens are very electronegative. Uh, we'll look at one more example up here. Uh, let's pretend that's a chlorine with the oxygen and hydrogen attached. Will this hydrogen pop off? For this one, HClO, that's hypochlorous acid, it will, but it's not very likely. It's kind of a weaker acid. But the more oxygens you add, here's HClO2, uh, chlorous acid, moving a little stronger, but still weak. Chloric acid, and here's perchloric acid. When you get the four oxygens on that chlorine, then you just got a whole mess of electronegative atoms pulling electrons toward them, and that hydrogen pops off very easily. And you've got a strong acid. So, all right, let's talk about the halogens for a moment. Hydrofluoric acid is actually a weak acid. A lot of people are like, oh, there's a strong acid, there's a strong acid, there's a strong acid. Hydroiodic, hydrobromic, hydrochloric. Why not hydrofluoric? Well, you know, that bond between H and F is actually more polar because fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. Yes, that's true, it's more polar. But because fluorine has a really tiny radius and the hydrogen has a really tiny radius, they get really close to each other and make an actual very strong chemical bond. So it's hard to break even though it is polar and we get a weak acid out of it. We'll look at a couple more examples before we end. We will not have any pause the video moments in this video. We're just covering some content here. Um, things you'll need to know about structures. Here's some oxo acids. And again, the more oxygen you add, generally the, the more negative the pKa becomes and the stronger the acid becomes, okay? We'll move through that. And that's true for the sulfates as well. Here we have a nice picture of nitric acid, which is that strong acid, a pKa of negative 1.4. So that's in the negative region, very strong. But HNO2 only has a pKa of 3.35 because it only has that one other oxygen on it to shift its electron density. There are other acids 
that are not among the six strong acids that are actually borderline strong, like for example, these chloro acids. Now take a look at what happens here. In regular acetic acid, this carbon here would be surrounded by hydrogens. They're not very electronegative and we'd have a weak acid. But as we start replacing those hydrogens with more and more chlorines, which are very electronegative, the more they pull electrons this way and the stronger the acid becomes. So by the time you get down to trichloroacetic acid, you have a pKa of 0.7, which is, uh, yeah, borderline pretty strong. So, and the same for the bromo acids. All right, you'll see a similar trend in that. All right, so um, these, are, of course, are not all of the acids that you could possibly uh, run into. Let's, we're going to make a swing back and talk about lactic acid. Lactic acid turns out to be a weak acid. Um, it ends up being a weak carboxylic acid because you have the OH attached to a carbon, which does have that double bonded oxygen to it, which pulls that electron density this way. That hydrogen can pop off then a little bit easier. Okay. Um, and so you end up with a, like a weak acid because of that. Okay, so again, these are not all the acids in the world. There's hundreds and thousands of them. But again, let's go back. The two factors um, that determine the extent to which something acts like a Brownstead acid, strength of the bond and the polarity of the bond. You may also be asked to question, um, A, which one is the stronger acid? So you're looking for the ones with the weaker bonds or the more polar bonds. And sometimes you'll be asked questions where it'll say, explain why nitrous acid is weaker than nitric acid. So they'll tell you which one's stronger or weaker, and you have to explain that. Go back to these two ideas here and try to use those to support the answer that you're writing. So again, not a lot of math today, a lot of conceptual things on strengths and weaknesses of acid and bases. I hope this help was helpful for you. And if you have any questions, you can send them to me in the comments or directly. In the meantime, happy problem solving and have a great day.